2020 has been a super challenging year for everybody in the retail industry, but especially men's tailored clothing wholesale. How exactly did it play out? What went down? And what does the future hold for the business? Well, today I spoke to Connor Dixon of Bolioli to figure out that very question. Let's get into it. Welcome to another episode of Retail Coffee Break. I guess for this episode, we should call it Retail I don't know, Happy Hour. I am here with a good friend of mine. He's a director of sales for Bolioli, Connor Luscious Locks Dixon, to talk about the state of retail in 2020. Thanks for coming, Connor. Thanks for having me, Nick. Thank you for the lovely introduction. So this is the, the COVID hairdo, huh? Yeah, you know, I actually have, I haven't cut the hair actually for uh, it's been over a year now. Yeah, last November. It before, looks uh, really good, dude. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, talking about you, let's get let's go back to the roots of Connor Dixon. Let's start from the beginning. Before we get into talking about, I want to cover talking about the state of retail, what you've seen this year with you know running a menswear brand amidst everything. But let's go back to you know your early beginnings, kind of in the industry. I, what brought you into the industry? You know, where where it, you've taken to get to where you are today, and just give me that recap. Yeah, so I guess as a kid, I I grew up in a very suburban area in uh, Pennsylvania called Lancaster, so it's like a very Amish uh, community, and there was no fashion. I was always very interested in fashion, um, so if I thought, well, if there's no fashion here, I'll create it myself. So I actually in high school started this. Uh, like bow tie business where I was sewing them myself and my mom taught me how to use a sewing machine and one thing led to another. I ended up employing a, uh, an Amish woman actually to sew my bow ties and uh, the business kind of took off quite well um, and then it evolved into leather goods um, which I still dabble in a little bit um, but that led me to college where I thought I was going to study finance and go into banking and go down this kind of very traditional sort of road, um, but uh, things changed after my freshman year, and I was like, this is just not a life that's cut out for me. Um, so I ended up in uh, two different fashion internships here in New York City um, before graduating college um, and uh, working uh, where I do now at Bolioli. So how are you, when you first started that business, just going back a second, I mean, how are you selling the, the product? Because you kind of, you were kind of like D2C before D2C, right? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was definitely, uh, I was definitely selling to you know, first off, like family and friends. Yeah, obviously, we're kind of those initial supporters, and then uh, yeah, kind of. I, I started to build out a website. Had a friend help me build out a website. Um, utilized Etsy, um, which was at the time a really, really great platform. I mm -hmm. think for you know individual makers and and uh, artisans to sell their product. Um, but yeah, dabbled a little bit in the wholesale road as well. Um, but again, this was you know when I was in high school. So right. The inroads were a little harder back then. So, I mean, listen, I, I, I grew up in Minnesota. You grew up in Lancaster. I, I knew going coming to the city that, you know, come to New York, you don't really know anybody. The fashion industry is notoriously sought after and hard to get into. How did you get your inroads, you know, to start getting either your first internships or, or even your you know first job at Bolioli or, or whatnot? Yeah, I think a lot of people always say, like, oh, I got a network. I have this vast network, this, you know, robust sort of, you know, uh, you know system of people and, and people that you can rely on to vouch for you, which is very, very true. And I think, you know, from a young age, I was, like, you know, kind of always honing my skills in that world. Um, but, yeah, I ended up networking to get an internship at Gilt uh, between my sophomore and junior year through an alumni who went to mm -hmm. my university. Um, and then led to another internship the following year um, at a showroom for Billy Reed. Um, and then I stumbled into our retail store actually on a New Year's Day um, when I was here in New York um, at Bolioli, and that's kind of how I ended up in my role today. So you stumbled into the retail store, and then what? Yeah, I was uh, I was definitely I was sort of looking for a job at the time in fashion, mm -hmm. but uh, there was actually a uh, a design studio named Demore out of Milan who had done a few small notable project at the time um, and one of them was our retail store here in New York City so I actually I was a bit of an architecture guy and loved design and stuff like that so I was like wow gotta check out this store I was kind of a fan of the brand for a few years before that um, from a trip that I had made to Barney's and I was like wow this uh, this space is absolutely gorgeous and it's a it's 
incredibly well designed and for anybody who's never been they should go it's mm-hmm. it's really a unique special place here in new york um ended up striking up a conversation with one of the managers there and one thing led to another and ended up working uh in the uh, showroom after that i mean that's pretty amazing to think that you just like walked in you know randomly and then it just like i mean you spent how, how many years have you been at bolioli now uh, i will be four years so yeah. one january 1st evening or day you just walked in and then you know, fast forward four years later and, and you're here. Yeah. I mean, you know, kind of sometimes timing, right? I mean, yeah. David, David, uh, David mm-hmm. Newlove hired me and, you know, we maintain an incredible friendship and mentorship. And I think that that's another really powerful tool that kind of gets you, gets you your inroads, you know, in the industry as well. Right. Yeah. But I'm sure it wasn't just, I mean, like, I think people would look at that and be like, oh man, that was such a lucky happenstance, but I'm sure there was other things happening that you, you know, you, I, know, I call it like luck surface area or people call it luck surface area of like you put yourself in a spot to be lucky and like, yeah that was you know lucky that it happened but yeah sure yeah yeah okay. you're right yeah, yeah <laughs> sure all right so let's fast forward okay so now you're you're running Bolioli um which you know obviously is mostly menswear maybe a little bit of women's wear um but it's obviously you know let's call it as it is it's in the jacket tailored clothing kind of I mean it's casual it's sporty it's definitely the most sporty version of what, you know, a Taylor clothing jacket would be, but it's still rooted in Taylor clothing. Take us to now, you know, like take us to March 15th or whatnot. So, I mean, March 15th hits, like no one knew it was coming. You know, everyone that works in Taylor clothing is like, all right, what the hell do I do now? <laughs> um, yeah. Like what's, what, what happens then on your end? Yeah, I mean, just to clarify, I mean, you know, there's a whole team running Bolioli. Of course, of course. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, but, you know, I think... Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think nobody at that time, I mean, it was it was definitely not something I think that people thought would last this long. And I don't think right. that people really saw the uh, the ramifications of shutting down an economy, working from home, um, you know, people not being able to go out and about, mm-hmm. you know, physical retail stores um, boarded up. Yep. You know, I mean, even if you go to Soho right now, you know, I was just walking around yesterday and it's still sort of kind of boarded yep. up. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think that like, the future consequences of the pandemic were obviously foreseen at the time. Mm-hmm. It just kind of all sort of unraveled as the pandemic mm-hmm. sort of kind of wore on and, and continued through till now. Really. Right. So, so, I mean, let's get a little bit more specific with that. Um, Cause a lot of things you can do, you know, as a wholesaler, I mean, obviously you've got to take some kind of action uh, without getting into too much in the specifics. You don't need to get into any like the you know, nitty gritty so much, but I guess like, what was your approach to, okay, maybe like in April or May, you know, you got to start making moves, you know, you're shipping product at that time. Are you trying to, you know, communicate with your retailers every day? Are you trying to figure out ways of, you know, pushing goods out? You try, like, what are you trying to do execution wise then? Yeah. I mean, at the time, I think we were definitely trying to mitigate the risk of cancellations, um, which was definitely the largest hurdle that we had from, right. you know, starting in, you know, really in April, May, when I think people started realizing like, oh my God, this is a real permanent you know, fixture here. Um, it's going to loom over us for a very long period of time. And yeah, people were certainly concerned for what that meant for their business moving forward. So, you know, I think we kind of went immediately to the drawing board and said, you know, well, we have to, you know, reduce as mm-hmm. much as we possibly can on the cancellation side, because, you know, if you're not shipping goods, you're not getting cash flow, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, in a, you know, for a fashion company like us, it's obviously the number right. one most important thing. Um, so it was really working, you know, on an absolute individual personal level with all the retailers and all the specialty stores um, just to assess their needs, you know, how the current environment was affecting them directly. Um, and then working on, you know, a, a, or partnering rather on um, something that felt equitable on both sides that didn't force, you know, our retailers into a, you know, a compromising position, but that obviously, you know, honored what we had to do as a business to move forward as well. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I think something that I was super happy to see on the outside. I mean, obviously I'm not in this relationship with retailers anymore. I have a different relationship with retailers now, but I was super, super pleasantly surprised at how well brands and retailers really did find a way to sort of come for the most part uh, to a, to a middle ground, you know, like I, I, I didn't hear that many stories. I mean, there's always people on the outskirts. There's always brands that are really like not forgiving and are just like, 
I don't care about you. I just use them. <laughs> like, I, we, we're not doing anything to help you. And there's retailers that are unreasonable too, of course. But I was really surprised and, and pleasantly surprised, I think, at like how well brands and retailers were able to figure out something that worked for both parties. The retailer understanding that the brand, they don't want the brand to go away. It, it fuels their store and then vice versa. So I thought that was very cool. Yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, in business too, it's, it's, like, it's like a relationship, right? I think there's always a give and a take. And I think, you know, you definitely don't want to, you know, soil or tarnish a relationship or an image that you have with somebody, you know, from, from your side as the brand, you know, forcing them into something. Or, right. you know, of course, if you're the retailer, you know, and just kind of being, like, well, nope, this is, this is it. You know, there is a little bit of that give and take. And I think that, you know, the retailers that we work with are all great partners. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were definitely lucky and thankful to have, you know, been able to work with them through it. So, okay. So when you say you're, you said you're in a relationship with your retailers, you're like a first date relationship, but you guys <laughs> married or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, married, you know, married, married with some of them, you know, cool. Um, past the honeymoon phase with most. So, you know. So let's talk about some other changes that have happened. I mean, obviously in the wholesale business in general, not just for you, but for everybody. So let's talk about market. So virtual market comes, I guess it has to be virtual. What do you guys do to, to, to manage that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's definitely a bit of a logistical challenge, of course, because, you know, you have to send physical swatches. I mean, the way we work is it's not a, a lookbook necessarily right. where it's like, wow, I love those pants. or I love that look. I want all of that. It's, oh, wow, I like that fabric. Yep. What colors does it come in? And, you know, when we have a garment dye, it's, you know, uh, you know, you might have seven or eight different fabrics. And it's a very, like, tactile environment where, you mm-hmm. know, you're, you're very much dealing with how it feels, how it looks, mm-hmm. how it drapes. So the world we work in is definitely a little bit different or a little bit more niche than some. I'll say it's the know. most challenging. Yeah. I mean, every single category that exists, I would say, like, you could pick any other category, men's, yeah. women's. Accessories, yeah. jewelry, it's got to be the hardest single category. Yeah, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, these, uh, you know, the online sort of ordering platforms and, you know, a lot of the retailers are trying to push that way. Yep. Um, and it's tough when we don't have a, a line sheet per se because it's, you couldn't possibly photograph thousands and thousands right. of items and you only sample one, you know, of each right. fabric and you might have eight, you know, and so right. obviously, you know, on a multiple of eight times, whatever, you have 300, 400 samples, you know, it's... It's a lot. Yeah. It adds up. It adds up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we really had to pivot to definitely doing the virtual markets, um, which for us comprise of sending the physical swatch sets, um, organizing and arranging, you know, uh, an actual, like, virtual showroom tour of mm-hmm. our showroom, um, which was very challenging the first time around. It's right. very hands-on. It's a lot of hand-holding, um, you know, and it's definitely a very inefficient way to do market. Um, this season, we do have a, uh, an in-house built uh, virtual showroom um, where we do have everything that's photographed from our sample collection that the retailers can actually go in and make um, their own line sheets. Mm-hmm. You know, so it works much like a, our own version of a new order or a chore. So it is a little bit more helpful this time around. Um, but you, you know, still lose that touch component. I mean, at the end of the day, like the one thing you, you do lose is, is the touch component, which is... You do lose the touch component. We are still sending the swatches okay. out. Yep. Um, you know, we're... we're we're not a brand where you can just buy off that image like we talked about. Yep. So, you know, it is finding and striking a little bit of a balance. But, you know, obviously with order deadlines and everything like that, it really becomes a game of, of efficiency. So that's really where we're trying to kind of hit, hit right now. What did you learn from market one? Because now we're in the second market, right? A virtual market? Correct. So we're in the second virtual market. Like what, what didn't go well in market one that was like, oh, we should not do that this way and do it differently in market two? Is there anything like that or...? Yeah, you know, a lot of things, <laughs> uh, a lot of things, but yeah, it, you know, it's, uh, I think it's just really challenging when you're not able to have the people in front of you, you know, to have, I mean, a lot of people, you know, they're busy, you know, if it's an independent right. retailer, they're literally also running a store, right. they're managing a sales team, yep. you know, they're dealing with whatever else comes their way on yep. a day-to-day basis. So to pull them out of, of that environment for even... 15 or 20 minutes can become, you know, almost excruciatingly painful or detrimental to them running their own business. So um, it, it becomes a little bit of a, of a challenge just to even get them on for 15 minutes. So part of it was, you know, finding out the right timing, you know, between, you know, us and between them, getting the swatch sets in time, um, which again proves to be costly in the shipping. Right. Um, you know, arranging, you know, the logistics of it. Um, and then, yeah, and then, 
a lot of the post market follow up is ve- was very very challenging. Mm-hmm. They want to see samples, they want to see photographs, right. they want to you know, they went back to one thing that they remember from the Zoom call where we walked into the showroom. It was behind this jacket, and now we're running through all the samples trying to find that jacket. Yep. So um, definitely, I think the virtual market tool that we've developed as a company is certainly going to come in handy a lot more, definitely in this market, mm-hmm. um, you know, just to allow them to go back and, and review and have the swatch in front of them, see a photo of the sample where right. we might not even have the capabilities to do right. that. So. So let's flip to the retailer side. So, I mean, you work with retailers every day. You're on the phone with the buyers. You're on the phone with the store owners, the salespeople. What, from your perspective, I mean, you're not there, but like just from what you saw, what did you see them do? You know, like over the last you know year, I guess let's focus on the positive side. Like what, from your guys' sales, removing some product, like what have you seen? All right, it's COVID, so I mean, there's very few things that are just blowing it out of the water and are absolutely silver bullet incredible. There probably isn't a silver bullet, but like, what have you seen be at least productive and helpful that you're seeing, you know, your retailers do? You know, honestly, uh, the move to a focus of online, which has been, I think, a huge conversation in the last, I don't know, 10 years, maybe, sure. right? I mean, everybody's trying to move online, the dot com, but e com has definitely become more important, I think, for these retailers. You know, we've seen the numbers where, you know, maybe at a retailer, just as an example, you know, we might have had 10% of our sales online mm-hmm. pre-COVID. Um, now it's closer to 40 or 50 or right. more. Um, so focusing the marketing dollars, focusing the photography, focusing the merchandising, you know, when you build out a look with a retailer, uh, knowing that's going to go online, you know, how do you propose that look online? Right. Um, and I think that that's definitely something that they've done a much better job of. Great photography, you know, um, being able to communicate that sort of tactile element or understanding how to put it together without necessarily needing, you know, that kind of, you know, that associate help, you know, you know showing right. you or putting it on you, et cetera. Um, but also the retailers have done, you know, uh, their own sort of, you know, softwares or even like a clienteling apps and stuff like that, that, um, you know, allow you to work with a particular associate, you know, at these retailers, you know, mm-hmm. Hey, I went in, I worked with Nick. Nick was great. Guy's information. Um, now I can work with him wherever I am in the world. Right. And he can show me online things that I've liked or that I've bought before and put it together and package it all. And I have it in two or three days. Yeah. It's definitely shown. I mean, even in, the, in your business, right? Like your clients at the stores, it's definitely shown how important the relationship is. Yeah. Like if you don't cater to these relationships, I know we joke about like the relationships, out there, but like it really is a relationship, you know, like yeah. if you don't, whether it's your clients or a retail store or your clients are, you know, the end customer buying the jacket, like it, it really does calm down to, it's almost like if you hit, if COVID hit and you had a, not a good relationship with your customers, those are the stores that got hit the hardest. You know, it's like, how are you consistently every day carrying to that relationship and growing it? Otherwise it might be too late to try to, you know, regain those or, or whatnot. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, it's, it's really that personal, that personal touch. I think, you know, uh, I was watching this interview with, uh, Elon Musk actually yesterday. And part Ooh. of it was like Elon Musk. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, one of the questions was, uh, you know, you know, who can innovate, you know, are, are, are humans going to always be the, the innovators right? or will AI and will robots be able to innovate to the same capacity or better? And his answer was just simply, you know, that AI and robots will be better innovators. Uh, at some point. And I think that obviously the the human element there is is still absolutely necessary to foster and to build right. trust, you know, and we're not quite there where you're trusting a robot or an AI component right. to do everything. But I think that as people, you know, and retailers do eventually evolve and grow, you know, you will be relying on, you know, technology, not necessarily robots or AI, but sure. technology and, and incorporating that kind of component because especially as we've seen over the last, you know, eight months, nine months, um, definitely going online using your phone. People mm-hmm. are a lot more comfortable. They're mm-hmm. doing a lot more. We just saw DoorDash's astounding IPO today, you know, sitting on your couch like this and getting food delivered like we just did 30 minutes ago. Yeah. I mean, this is all just moving a lot faster than probably anybody else anticipated at this point. Yeah, I mean, it really is interesting. I mean, because like the biggest, I mean, you're right. The biggest change has been the whole, you know, online thing. It's, it's kind of funny to say in 2020 that you now online is now becoming a thing because it's been yeah, around. Right. It's, it's, it really is kind of like really yeah. crazy. Mm-hmm. But that being said, I mean, like for, for until now in in 
killer clothing, especially, I mean, especially comparatively to say women's wear, some other more progressive categories, it hasn't ever been at the forefront, even for the people that are driving huge volume from it. You know, it's always, how do you merchandise the store? How are you buying for your stores? And then we'll loop around to online at some point at the end or whatnot. And now it's literally flipped, right? Of like, you got to think about that first almost and, and then think about everything else after that. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. And I think the acceleration of it too, it, I think it definitely caught some people a little bit, you know, off guard. I think, uh, especially when you don't have that presence or you've never relied on it before. And I think there are, I know there are very, very strong independent retailers that don't rely on e-com. They rely on the, most of them. Yeah. yeah <laughs> most of them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, as, as we see now, uh, moving forward, it will definitely be, you know, a way of either acquiring a new customer or being able to, you know, go, go back to an existing customer and offer another value proposition to somebody who maybe doesn't live in the area. How do you think about distribution as a wholesaler, right? Where your business is, I mean, you're a luxury brand, uh, accessible luxury brand, but still a luxury brand. Um, you care about the way your brand is perceived in the market. You care about the stores you're in. You care about who you sit next to. How do you think about that when it comes to, to e-commerce? You know, because you're literally, you know, in, a, in an eight-month window, increasing your footprint online because people are putting websites up, putting your product online. There's, you know, now there's almost price transparency because you can go to all, any of these retailers. Whereas before, it'd be really hard to tell from a brick-and-mortar retailer in Oklahoma to Sacramento who was charging what. Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point. I think the other thing that's kind of interesting, too, about what you just said was the transparency, right? And I think, you know, it, it does feel like it's always a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, when markdowns come around, you know, all the retailers are kind of, you know, getting your approval for certain items or can we mark down this? Are you okay to mark down now um, or on this future date? But it always feels like it's a race to the bottom. I think, you know, one retailer breaks, everybody breaks. Yep. And I think that, um, you know, looking at it from a, from a transparency, I think you, you know, you work transparency, you know, thinking about what that means for the overall marketplace, right? Right. And, and I think how, you know, you can position your brand to be next to other brands or X, Y, Z. Sometimes it's not necessarily about the brands that you're next to or how you're marketed on that platform, but, you know, just that you are making the conscious effort to, to do it and to be there just in the first place is, like, I think, step number one. I mean, you hear of a lot of brands that think that they're too exclusive, you know, yep. to be online or, you know, they're, they're too hot to be online and they're just selling through their own e-com platforms. But I think that, you know, with a little bit more transparency from everybody and understanding like the markdown cadences, just by being online and having the opportunity for a customer to find you, whether it be on a major retailer or an independent retailer, it, it gives you that option, you know, to put your face out there. And then I think the transparency, obviously on the retailers and the brand side to, you know, at least align things in, a, in, a, in an appropriate markdown cadence that makes sense for everybody is it's definitely a first step to getting there. But are, you, are you guys trying to do stuff with the appropriate markdown cadence? Are you guys trying to, I don't think control it, but trying to, I don't know, like yeah, well, work with I, your retailers on it, I guess? Yeah, I mean, there was that whole, I mean, yeah, there was a whole call, I think, early in COVID to realign the, the markdown calendar, sure. right? I mean, there was designers and retailers and everybody saying, oh, we're going to realign and flip everything and buy now, wear now, we're going to mark down it. I think that the overall retail uh, climate painted a very different picture for everybody. And I, I think that it was, everybody was quick to realize that it's not the right time to do it. I think when you're sitting on that much inventory and you well, have to turn it, it's not. It, it's it, nice to think it's, about, it's, it's, it's a nice, listen, there is a, there is, a, okay, the, the problem is correct. There is a problem with the markdown cadence of retail. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, uh, absolutely. Like the whole thesis of a one line thesis of like, we're marking down overcoats in November is correct. The issue is it's all fine and dandy if you're living in a fantasy world where you can you know, do all this stuff. I shouldn't say fantasy world, but you're living in a, a world where you can actually ha take the liberty of, of resetting this. But to your point, it's a race to the bottom of one person breaks, everybody else breaks. But it's also the economics of it. Yeah. It's like you need to turn your inventory, if, even if, you know, that means potentially taking a, a, a lower margin or, or on some things, let's say. Yeah, you can't just, as a retailer, you can't just sit on, you know, two years of supply. Right. And then not mark things down. That's just right. irresponsible as right. a business. Um, it's just a complicated problem. At the end of the day, like, the proposal was correct, in, in my opinion. I'm oh, absolutely to, it was. I'm not trying to say, like, it wasn't. Like, it was yeah. totally correct. And the thought process was, was absolutely there. It's just such a hard problem. 
and it's almost yeah. like the whole world needs to do it at the same time. And online amplifies that, right? Like it would have to be price unison across every retailer of a single brand on earth with no discounting and the same cadence at the same time. Yeah, and I think uh, right. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But yeah. it was also just the the timing of it. Like, yeah, like I think everybody like wanted to use this as a reset button. Yeah, I, I just think that the situation I think was. There's an argument that it should be the opposite. Possibly. Actually, do reset in the best possible time ever when the market's at a high. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, like if we're trying to do this when the retail environment's never been harder. There's an argument we made. We want to reset the fashion season when nobody needs to mark down because we had a great full price selling season. It's true. You know, like yeah. the peak of the boom or whatever. You know, yeah. like let's reset the fashion season then because everyone sold through their market. They got their gross margin already from the full price sell through. You don't need to mark down that. You know, you can you can do it then, but it's hard when it's. Well, I think like you see a rise right? of you know seasonless collections and yep. brands that build themselves as seasonless and. You know they don't really work on a on a on a shipping or a, a seasonal flow. They just work on, you know, drops or right. they work on you know oh once a month we do you know this product launch or X Y Z. So yeah, I mean I, th- I think it's there's definitely you know small little ripples and it'll definitely take time, but it's definitely the right line of thinking. It's sure. good. It's good that we're talking about it. Yeah, At the end of the right. day, as an industry, like it's good that we're talking about this this problem that does need to be addressed. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, all right, so let's fast forward. Okay. Okay. It's dis- what is it? December eighth today. It's December eighth, twenty twenty one. One year from today. Let's just imagine. Let's just imagine that it's um. It's all good. Pandemic is gone. Retail is open. It's safe. Everyone's back out. Let's just assume that the environment is sort of relatively back to normal. How do you see the the industry? What do you see changes that are going to stick? Uh, Changes that aren't going to stick. Like, how do you see the state of the industry? Yeah, I mean, I think specifically talking about you know bullyoli and it working in this sort of you know traditional like you know clothing and luxury sportswear world. Um, you know, I think the one thing that we talk about a lot is the fact that you're not. I don't think the vaccine is necessarily going to get men you know, running back to their stores to buy tailored clothing, to buy a sport coat. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the vaccine allows people freedom and allows people, um, you know, uh, peace of mind, you know, to be able to go outside and to, you know, not fear, you know, getting sick or, you know, contracting the virus or passing it along to others. I think that the immediate thing that people are probably going to jump to are things like, you know, restaurants, bars, nightlife traveling, hospitality. I think all of those industries will certainly by this time be rebounded, um, provided that there's not, you know, a continued or a prolonged outbreak and that the vaccine does prove effective and enough people take it. And, you know, as long as all the factors are you know, in play and they right. do. Um, yeah, I, I think that looking at our world, though, it's yes, will men be back in the office? Sure, they'll be back in the office. Um, but I think that the men that are going into the office right now you know, who traditionally would wear a suit and tie or who traditionally would wear a sport coat and a dress shirt, they're going back in the office uber casual. Right. Uber casual now. Polos, golf polos, you know, just casual trousers, sneakers. Right. Um, so I think fast forwarding a year from now, even if our side of the business recovers to say 80% of what it was, it'll be a huge win. I, I don't know that men are necessarily going to be you know, rushing back to go into, you know, that traditional, you know, work office uniform. Um, you know, I think uh, one of my roommates said, you know what, I never want to wear another pair of pants if it's not elastic waistband. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I mean, that's a fair point. Like, I get it, you know. Some people I, might be saying, I never want to wear another pair of pants. <laughs> I've been in my underwear behind a Zoom thing with the <laughs> shirt and no, the, my underwear yeah. on. But I think to, to flip this this around, this uh, the scenario around, I also think that, you know, a lot of men are sick of wearing sweatpants. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, yeah. I know I am. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I recently wore a sport coat to go out to, to dinner, you know, uh, and I was like, oh my God, this is the most dressed up I've been in nine months and mm-hmm. I work for, a, you know, a luxury sportswear company. Yep. Excuse me. So I think, uh, yeah, I think that the industry is definitely going to be, you know, significantly different. I think that the importance is not going to lie necessarily on the, the tailored aspect of the clothing, but you know, more on what, you know, ends up kind of pairing back to everything, you know, that kind of fits that, you know, mentality of, yeah, I can wear this to the office, I can wear this to dinner, I can wear this on the weekend. Um, 
and I, I don't necessarily feel that that's going to necessarily just drive people to the suited world again. Right. So I, it's safe to say as a, as a men's primarily jacket brand, diversification is on your mind. How can we start to, you know, I hate to say the word lifestyle brand, but how do we get more into other categories to your point yeah. about the freedom thing about giving guys other options? Yeah. I mean, I think that's been a, a huge conversation for us. It's, you know, we, we want to be the, the, you know, we want to be the wardrobe or the, you know, the outfitting brand for every right. single touch point of your day and of your life. So the second you put, you wake up in the morning, you go to the gym. What are you wearing to the gym? Maybe you're not exercising in Bully Bully, but maybe you're commuting to the gym in something casual, you know, something with, you know, that has that sort of athleisure feel to it. And then you're going to the office, you know, and what are you wearing to the office? And then you're going out. So I think we've always been talking about that. And I think that we are fortunate as a, as a brand that we've always been more on the casual clothing side of things. Um, but I think, again, as we talked about the acceleration of things like e I think everything has just been accelerated and we work in a very slow fashion world where it's six months or a year behind because right now while we're presenting fall 21 they're working on fall 22 right so it's really almost two years behind to a a degree you know and i think um that makes it very hard for us to be super adaptive you know and streamlined to exactly what we need i think any traditional clothing company faces these challenges for sure I mean, it'll be interesting for sure. I mean, I think everybody is excited to see. Excited, I, maybe is not the right word, but we're all we're all looking to see. It. We're yeah. all anticipating yeah. what's what's gonna what's gonna happen, I guess, in in the in the coming months and and even years potentially. Okay, so we're gonna close it out. I'm gonna ask you a couple of closing personal questions now. Okay. The, the inside the mind of Connor Dixon and your own own opinions, your own life. <laughs> okay. I, all right, and it's it's I'm gonna throw a curveball in because it's retail happy hour, not retail coffee break. So I'm going to start with what is your go-to evening cocktail or drink? Oh, we, we, we drink exclusively martinis in this apartment. Exclusively like, any specific type of martini or dry, you know, dry gin martinis or okay. Vesper martinis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. What is your favorite retailer or brand at the moment? Ooh, can I name a favorite? Um, or two favorites. I think Mike Amiri has been on fire for a long time. And I think that he's definitely reached that like almost hype God status. Yeah. Like that cultural, you know, he's definitely infiltrated the, you know, the, the cultural relevancy of, you know, you know, rap and hip hop lyrics. And I think you definitely see things that he's doing. Um, kind of everywhere and I think that his yeah. influence is far reaching I think what he's doing is absolutely incredible where I shouldn't say where it's not the right way of phrasing that what is your favorite retail innovation at the moment so things that are changing in, in the state of retail hmm personal favorite you're like that's pretty cool like I'm, I'm excited that it's happening You know, I think the one thing is, and I, I you know, I, I think sustainability is a, it's now just a catchphrase. It's just kind of, it's a blanket statement for a lot of companies to sort of, you know, feel like they're on par with what people are asking for. So sustainability, we can go into a whole separate conversation if you want to have another topic on sustainability. So you're going to say sustainability. Um, All right. <laughs> but, but I would say that uh, something that's, I think, personally, I think, pretty interesting is when you see uh companies like levi's for instance capitalizing on this trend and i mean obviously levi's has been way ahead of the curve for a long time with you know thinking about the environment mm-hmm. and how to use you know less water and stuff like that to now where they're actually going to be selling you know used jeans by right. somebody and giving them a second life you know or a third life or a fourth life to right. another consumer um through their own online platform so i think that that's a super cool innovation right now yeah i couldn't agree more. I'm super excited to see what changes with yeah. that. Um, okay, final question. Okay. This is the this is the the doozy potentially. I, I, uh, what is a belief you have about the retail industry or the future of the retail industry that's not commonly agreed with? Hmm. It's a tough one. It's not what the curveball I thought you were gonna throw. Um, wait, 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 wait. What did you think I was gonna throw? No, I thought you were gonna just stop there with what do you? <laughs> The not common, not commonly held. 
doesn't have to be adamantly disagreed with, but like what something that maybe like you think a little bit differently on. You know, I, I mean, I think the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, a lot of people say retail is dead, right? I think that that's definitely something that whether you're in the industry, you're out of the industry, you work in some fringe industry, or you're just, you know, you just you don't work in the industry at all. Right. I, I think a lot of people say, oh, retail's dead. You know, shopping malls are dying. Brick and mortar retail. Brick and mortar retail yeah. is, is going to fall away. Um, I think that it's it's going to face challenges. Absolutely, it'll face challenges. It is facing challenges, but I don't necessarily see that it's going to just go away. I think to your point earlier, you know, are they going to have to reinvent themselves? Uh, I'm not sure they're going to have to reinvent themselves, but they're going to have to adapt to the times. Um so I think that the, the importance of brick and mortar retail is still going to be high, if not higher than ever. I think when you scroll through Instagram and you get sponsored ads or you see XYZ you know, tap and then you discover brands that way, which you know I've done many times and discovered brands that way, um, it, it just becomes a flooded marketplace. I think there's just so much out there right now that I personally cannot walk into a store that's... 10,000 square feet and three floors of men's clothing, which I don't think even exists. But if it did, I couldn't shop there. Right. I, I need a small curated experience to discover a brand, a niche brand that I've never sure. heard of. Or just to see it, you know, propose it through somebody else's lens. Right. Um, and I, I think that, you know, especially after COVID, when people are looking to, you know, reconnect with people and, you know, find true meaningful connections, I think that that's going to span further than just human to human. It'll be human to you know, product or, you know, we're in my apartment right now with a ton of plants, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I think it, it has to go beyond that. Yeah. So um, I do think that those connections and that inspiration and that sort of, you know, desire to be around something new is going to, you know, extend to retail. I think that's a perfect way to end it. I couldn't have said it better myself. All right. Cheers. Cheers, cheers. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Where can, uh, if people want to get a hold of you or want to follow you, what you're up to, where can they see, find that? Um, I am not uh, very active on social medias, uh, but I am on social medias if necessary. If you want to find me on... Connor Dixon on the social medias. Connor Dixon on the show's social medias. You can find me there. All right. Cheers. Cool. Thanks, buddy. Cheers. Thanks for having me, Nick. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Retail Coffee Break. Hit the subscribe button below. Hit the like button. New episodes as well as videos around the fashion and retail business are coming out every single week. So... We'd love to have you join us here in the community to talk about retail. We'll catch you next time.